Coming up next on Twitch this week in computer hardware, we've got a festival of bulldozer. We're talking AMD folks, some strange, strange ideas from Intel, advice on choosing between Core i5 and i7 for your next PC, and help getting your iFinity card cabled up. Coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 121, recorded May 26, 2011. Intel's getting bulldozed. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high quality website or blog. For a free 14 day trial, go to squarespace.com slash twitch and be sure to check out their annual plans for savings of up to 20%. And by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies streamed to your PC, Mac, or TV instantly. Plus, get DVDs by mail in about one business day. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Welcome to Twitch. This week in computer hardware, I'm Patrick Norton. Join us always, well, actually not always, because the man <laughs> was in Dubai last week. What were you doing on the other side of the planet in the desert or in the ocean next to the desert? Um, I wasn't in the ocean. I was definitely in the desert. I, I was out there um, for a tech event, actually. We went out there. AMD brought a bunch of journalists out to talk about Lano, uh, upcoming processor technology, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they brought us out there because that's where Global Foundries is based. Global Foundries now being the manufacturing mm -hmm. arm at, uh, or not under AMD, but, you know, who manufactures AMD's processor. So it was kind of a co-sponsored event type of thing, Global Foundries, basically trying to show off Here's where we're at. We're very serious about this. Have some fun in Abu Dhabi and Dubai while you're out here type of thing. Got to drive uh, uh, an F3 circuit car on an F1 track in, in Abu Dhabi and went to the tallest building in the world in Dubai and all that other kind of stuff. So it was a lot of fun. It was hot. It was definitely hot, <laughs> but it was, a, it was, was a lot of fun. I was having that same thought when I got off the plane this morning in Phoenix and I was like, oh, it's springtime. It's 90 degrees. I do not want to be here in August. <laughs> the surface, the uh, asphalt surface temperature while we were racing the cars was 141.3 Fahrenheit. So that's painful, dude. It was hot. And I was in a fire suit and in a helmet and all that other kind of stuff. So luckily, when you drive 170 miles an hour, it kind of cools things down. So <laughs> were you actually driving 170 miles yes. an hour? Yeah, we got up to about 170 yeah. on the straightaway. Yeah. yeah you physically steering wheel. Whoops. Yep, yep, yep. Me physical steering wheel, paddle shift on it. You know, it's a one-seater. Yas 3000 is the actual type of, uh, of the car it was. And anybody who was in the chat room after the PC Perspective podcast last night, we watched a little bit of the YouTube video. They had a camera over your head and a camera pointed at your face. So you kind of got <laughs> like a video of it as well. So it was, it was, it was fun. It was very cool. Oh my goodness, it uh, makes me even more disappointed. I actually was offered the chance to join Audi on a junket um, yeah. in, uh, for the 24 hours of Le Mans, and I couldn't do it because it's the week we swip, we're switching Texel to a, a live production. We're basically changing our production model on Texel, and I was like, no, I cannot fly to Paris and then go to Le Mans for the giant amazing race I've been reading about since I was a zygote. I would think and you before could find I start a fill it for the live for the live Texilla, but hey, that's just me. Yeah, you know, sometimes you look at your boss and you think he's not going to respond well to this question, <laughs> so we'll just we'll do the right thing, as they say. Core i7 990x Gulftown processor, the DX58 SO2 motherboard review. We talked about this. I could I think we talked about this a little bit next week, or I should say last week. You were really excited about this motherboard and chip. Uh, combination all six yeah. smoking thousand dollar core well thousand dollars for six smoking cores of <laughs> of multi-threaded joy right exactly i mean it's it, like there's not a whole lot more to get into on the processor side of things it's it, it's the next stepping up faster processor it's six cores it's hyper threaded it's 12 megs of cash it's it's you know it's it's the top of the line fastest desktop consumer part you can buy um 
there's really no denying that the benchmarks show it. It's not much faster than the 980X, and there are some instances where the Sandy Bridge processors can rival it in terms of single and dual threaded performance because the clock speeds on those processors can get so high. Um, but, you know, they're quad core, not six core. So anything that's going to be threaded in any way, shape, or form is definitely going to perform better on this. The motherboard itself uh, was also very interesting. It's an Intel branded board. If you've never given an Intel branded board a shot, I would recommend looking at this review at the very least and, and seeing things, uh, little tweaks, little extras. And it's not a rundown board or it's not a, a cut down board at all. It has USB 3.0. It has SATA 6. Uh, it has uh, Bluetooth and uh, Wi-Fi integrated on it. It has lots and lots of features that you might ne not necessarily associate with an Intel board. But their board division has done a very good job of, of, of coming up with consumer branded, consumer oriented products. And I think it does a really good job. I know if you've built a lot of computers, you know, one of the things that kind of always irks me is those BIOS options that have little to no description about what settings you're changing. Um, and I think that is, I think that's a, a lot of it is, is, is not, not English as your native language. People who don't necessarily understand that this is going to a consumer that may not know what the C20M setting does on a processor. <laughs> Uh, but in, Intel was was very good, and their BIOS engineers were very good about including descriptions on that type of thing. So, you know, again, it, the, the processor is $1,000. This is only for people who need the fastest or don't have to worry about finances, really. Uh, the motherboard, <laughs> however, could apply to a wider range of, of people looking to buy, uh, build a system based on 1366 processor socket. Keeping in mind that this is, quote, old technology. It's not slow or anything like that. It's the fastest out there, but you're talking about this is two desktop launch iterations previous from where we're at today. We have Sandy Bridge and before that we had uh, Clarkdale and Linfield on the 1156 socket. So, you know, we're getting close to the end of life here if this is not the last processor in this, in this socket type, but uh, hmm. in terms of top speed, it's, it's definitely there. It's not dead yet. It's speaking no. of it's not dead yet, I, I keep looking at the Cray article. Cray announces AMD bulldozer CPU and NVIDIA Tesla GPU supercomputer capable of 50 petaflops. And then I go, I thought Cray went bankrupt. Cray supercomputers of the gods, um, which are now this mostly might be showing up. I guess, but... Uh, so, well, well, not, it's not really marketing, but somebody licensing the name or something like that, but it's right. still impressive hardware. 50 petaflops is a lot of calculations. How do we quantify that for, for everybody at home? I mean, it's a 50 petaflops. So uh, it was a very big, big deal. Oh, 50,000 trillion operations per second. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, which still doesn't mean jack to any of us, I would imagine. But it sounds um, really good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it's it's what's what's interesting about this system is it's their their blades otherwise known I think they're actually two U or one U um, little uh, individual servers each server consists of four processors I believe four Opteron processors are going to include um, they're going to wait for the new si uh, sixteen core Opteron bulldozer. 32 nanometer processors that will be out sometime later this year, probably towards the end end of this year, maybe Q3. And inside one of these 2U racks is also a pair of uh, NVIDIA Tesla X2090 Fermi-based embedded graphics cards. So this takes arguably the fastest, well, hopefully will be one of the fastest processors when it's released, a 16-core part, and some of the fastest GPUs for GPU computing and kind of combines right. them all. And I think they say that each cabinet is capable of storing 24 of these blades and supplies 50 kilowatts of power. Um, each of the GPUs is individually capable of 665 gigaflops. That's floating point operations per second. And yeah, so four, no, four GPUs, 24 blades, looking at 63 teraflops of computing power just for the graphics cards. And then I think... I don't know. It's something, yeah, like 44 well, petaflops of horsepower. It's 
it's funny because you think of Blade, it's always like, you know, energy sipping, you know, it, it's always like energy sipping servers. It's all about minimizing the heat and the electrical footprint. And then you look right. at these things and they're just monsters. The picture of this up on the on PC Perdom is PC Perdom.com is amazing. And I'm up on the Cray webpage and mm -hmm. Cray Research mer merged with Silicon Graphics in 1996. In 1999, they created a separate Cray Research business unit. Okay. Um, and then the Terra Computer Company, I guess, developed software for the multi-threaded architecture on the Cray MTA2 and went public and then acquired Cray Research from SGI back in 2000. And I guess it says the, the PC Pro article says the Swiss National Supercomputing Center is the uh, base, I guess the first adopters taking the Cray mm -hmm. XK6 based supercomputer, quote, not for its raw performance, but because the Cray X6, XK6 promises to be the first general purpose supercomputer based on GPU technology. And we are very much looking forward to exploring its performance and productivity on real applications relevant to our scientists. Like encoding giant they collections of movies. <laughs> Notice they didn't <laughs> mention a price or anything on this which is probably good news for the rest of us. You know, there's about 300 <laughs> cabinets full of these XK6 blades, which is how we get the, the approximate 44 petaflops of computing horsepower capable. Well, the, I mean, going. the... The electrical requirements to feed this thing are just, you know, it, yes. it, it, okay, maybe it's only pulling like, you know, 10 kilovolts, but it's still pretty crazy. But you're talking about like... 50 the, kilowatts per cabinet. 50 kilowatts per cabinet. But I mean, like, even if that's the max, right, and they're only pulling right. a quarter of that, it's still a ridiculous amount of electricity to pull into a computer lab. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting because I, I got to say, I did not realize Cray was still functioning. And I'm looking at the website and it's like classic cool guy, high end supercomputing weather prediction, mm -hmm. you know, predicting seismic events, which is kind of voodoo. But it'd be interesting <laughs> to talk to somebody about you know, what the real high-end supercomputing, you know what I mean? Because like weather modeling is the one that always blows my mind. We start looking at the unbelievable amount of computing um, mm -hmm. power that can be absorbed by that. Must yeah. find someone to talk to about weather modeling. Nice. Um, do you, you want to talk about the, on the, on the bulldozer themes, we talked about the leaked bulldozer info. Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> there, there was some information that came out in terms of bulldozer pricing clock speeds specifications those types of things the to me probably the most interesting part is here that there's going to be an eight core there's gonna be eight core and four core i believe bulldozer parts the eight core fx 8130p is going to be the model number but we don't need to worry about that for quite some time the important part is it is a 3.8 gigahertz part that will run at 4.2 gigahertz in what they're calling turbo mode which i'm guessing is going to be very similar to what intel has done with their kind of turbo boost technology it has a tdp of 125 watts and will sell for 320 dollars so hmm. Pricing point, we're talking late Q2. Well, we're already at late Q2. So we're talking Q3 <laughs> or Q4, 4.2 gigahertz, eight core AMD processor, $320. That hmm. sounds really cool. That sounds really nice. You know, we're talking about a lot of computing power for not a whole lot of money. That's about the same price yeah. as the Core i7 2600K to kind of put you at a level of, of where we're at there in terms of, of pricing and segmentation. And you guys got a sneak peek at the 990FX, the new motherboards for the bulldozer. And right. I'm you gathering from the title, you are mad excited about those. <laughs> yeah, so what's, what's, when we've talked about on the show, a lot of people wanted to upgrade to AMD motherboards or build AMD platforms, but we kept saying, you know, you really should wait for the, the motherboards that are going to be capable of upgrading to bulldozer processors. Well, those are finally going to start coming out here probably in the next week or so. I imagine we'll see a big launch uh, the first day of Computex, which is on the 31st of May. So I, I think you'll see hard availability right around that first week of June as well. So these will be AM3 plus processor sockets. We've seen previews from an MSI 990FX motherboard and an ASUS 990FX Sabertooth motherboard. And they don't really, other than the new the new chipset and new socket, not a whole lot has changed here. Um, it, it, the, the ability to support the bulldozer processors as well as current Phenom parts is kind of what is key there. So you'll be able to build a system today on Lano and a 990FX board or any of the 900 series boards that will launch for, for a modest cost, knowing that Q4 
or obviously in 2012, you'll be able to upgrade to one of these bulldozer parts like that $320 eight core processor, which is, which is pretty awesome. Also, these chipsets are going to be the first that will support NVIDIA SLI. So if you, you know, were kind of worried about not being able to do NVIDIA's multi-GPU technology, we talked about that, I think, a few weeks ago that they had announced, yes, we're finally going to enable SLI on this chipset. So that's, that's combined is very good news. Now we're starting to get information about processors. We don't really have any info on performance. Actually, when we, if we go back to that, if, we, if you look at the Cray story, they specifically, they don't quote gigaflops or anything like that for the processor section of the supercomputer because they're not announced processors had an AMD didn't want any kind of performance information leaking out but you know the, the the capabilities are are finally kind of coming into light we're going to be able to understand obviously before the bulldozer launch actually hits us what they're capable of so that's that's pretty cool stuff there yay Yep, I'm excited. So if, you, I, if you're interested in AMD systems, it's, it will be, you know, right after Computex will be a very interesting <clears> time to start looking at that hardware. Uh, you know, we'll obviously have reviews of it and stuff like that at, at PC Perspective, and I'm sure you guys will talk about it on TechZilla. It'll be interesting where that falls in line in terms of pricing and performance, where it falls in line on our hardware leaderboard and our overall recommendations <laughs> for consumers. Hopefully, we'll see some competition for Sandy Bridge in that kind of mainstream to, to high-end enthusiast PC building market. I know what we can expect when that gets released, which is price drops on everything Intel makes, um, just to be cruel in the highly That's competitive the CPU marketplace. That's the fear <laughs> for AMD, right? Is that they're yeah. going to come out with a decent part. Keep in mind that, I mean, they're selling an eight core, four point something gigahertz processor for $320. That's not a whole lot of money. Uh, that's obviously going to be their top of the line part if all those numbers work out. Right. It would be very easy for Intel to go, yeah, you know what, our $320 part is now 250 What are you going to do about that? And uh, they have the <laughs> capability and, and financial, financial capability to do that as well. Uh, I remember uh, doing a review. Oops, sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, no, I remember doing a review of a Cyrex part, one of the early Cyrex parts, and basically being like, it's faster than your part, and they're charging, a, you know, X amount less for it. And I got a call, like, 45 minutes later, and, and Intel had decided to drop the price on the part just so they could beat Cyrex in the category. Um, they are a competitive crew, mm -hmm. the folks at Intel, which is good for, you know, my ability to afford fast systems. Indeed. Uh, <laughs> let's take a quick break here. Thank one of today's podcast sponsors. That would be Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high quality website or blog. So you have an interest in computer hardware, video games, uh, movies, anything like that. You want to create a website for it. Anything you want to do, internal websites for your company, external websites for a uh, high school reunion, anything like that. Squarespace.com is the place to go to do hosting, design, upkeep, maintenance, all that good stuff. It's, it has a, they have an easy to use user interface for creating and managing a website or blog. You don't have to have a lot of experience or any experience really building websites to get up and running here. It's optimized for both beginners and CSS experts. So if you want to get down to the nitty gritty, which I cannot stand anymore, you have that capability to do that with Squarespace. They have hundreds of design templates to choose from and you can customize any of the designs to fit your needs. Uh, beautiful iPhone and iPad apps for updating your blog on the go. They have online resources and a special support team to give you help 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So you're not sitting there struggling, searching on Google Docs or searching on Google rather for endless help on, on anything you can you need there. It is an all-inclusive service. It includes uh, modules to build your website, like a blog module that includes import and export support for all kinds of popular um, blogging platforms. It has a form builder if you want to collect email addresses or other information from your site visitors. Flickr photo display, Twitter widgets to display tweets on your website in a customizable format, Google Maps, and a lot more. They have website tracking so you know how many times your site is viewed and a built-in search engine optimizer. That always is nice. Permission access handling if you want to have multiple users editing and updating the same site. That is, that is good as well. It's built on a cloud architecture for speed and site stability. So you don't have to worry about your website going down. If you suddenly get a lot of traffic, you get linked on from some of the, some of the large sites like Slashdot or Dig or Engadge or anything like that, they will make sure you stay up. You can use Squarespace for all of your website needs. Build it host it and update it anytime. Now, if you want to try it out for, a, for 14 days, completely free, go to squarespace.com slash twitch, T-W-I-C-H, 
You can sign up for a free account. No credit card needed. Just try it out and start building your website. You've got two weeks to enjoy the service, see how much you're going to like it and how much I think you're going to want to stay with them. When you do, be sure to check out their annual plans that can save you as much as 20% off the month-to-month -month rate. That's squarespace.com slash twitch, and we thank them for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware. Now, on to more news of certain sorts. This is interesting link you sent me uh, this afternoon about the possibility of Intel manufacturing non-x86 CPUs. So we should qualify this by saying it's a Reuters article, and I don't want to take anything away from the Reuters reporters and stringers, but it is not my usual go-to source for tech reporting. Sure. Yeah. But the, the you know Paul Sandel uh, in London, here's the lead. Intel Corp would consider making chips for rivals, but any proposal to use its advanced manufacturing technology to make processors based on a computing architecture would trigger a quote, in-depth discussion, unquote. So, um, and it's interesting because I guess um, uh, he was in an interview with some of the financial mavens at Intel, CFO, uh, the chief financial officer, Stacy Smith, quote, there are certain customers that would be interesting to us and certain customers that wouldn't. Uh, he said Intel nice. would be happy to produce chip cores based on its own architecture for other companies, but that allowing rival architectures to be manufactured in its plants would be a tough decision, right? Because Intel is essentially has a huge lead over its competitors in terms of the process, the amount they have actually shrinked. Um, you know, the, the individual right. transistor size, right? So, you know, um, you know, if Apple or Sony came to us and said, I want to do a product that involves the Intel architecture core and put some of my IP around it, I wouldn't blink. That would be a fantastic business for us. And I was looking at this and I was thinking there was a, a an article we were talking about on, on Techzilla this week where a guy did sort of a social graph of, you know, the, 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 the infograph of the social unisphere and, and, it's it's a link in show notes, but the core of it is, and the reason everybody's fighting so hard for the mobile CPU market, right, is, you know, NVIDIA pointed out, or it's AMD, no, NVIDIA pointed out at uh, CES, right, that they, you know, they want to, they ARM is the computing processor of the 21st century, um, and there's five point, the, the, this infographic said there's 5.3 billion mobile users in the world. Now, to put that into context, there's like 650 million Skype users and like 630 million Facebook users and another, you know, 500 million or so users of the one of the big uh, social networks in China. Mm -hmm. But the idea is that, you know, the most pervasive computing device in the world or the most affordable computing device that will be used by the biggest number of people in the world is going to be a mobile device. So this is Intel basically sure. looking at, you know, Apple, Sony, mm -hmm. and probably anybody else out there who wants to sell. Basically, I think this is part of Intel's continuing efforts or their continuing assault on the ARM platform. They desperately want a bigger piece of the mobile market. So, yeah, and they definitely it, want Apple's market. <laughs> there, well, yeah, there are... Uh, Shades of what AMD did with Global Foundries in this type of story and rumor is that, remember, AMD did it more because they were having financial problems. They, they split off the manufacturing arm. The manufacturing arm now has other mm -hmm. customers besides AMD making all kinds of different things, although AMD is still far and away their biggest and most important customer. Um, Intel last year, I believe it was either 09 or, or, or 2010, announced that they were going to allow the manufacturing of Intel x86 architectures at third party foundries. So in theory, a customer could build uh, an SOC built around an Atom core, for example, at TSMC. And that was a big deal because it was the first time Intel has let their architecture outside of their own manufacturing facilities. This would allow this one, this theory here would be like, well, it makes sense, of course, if, if somebody big wants to come and say, hey, uh, we want a custom Intel chip, Intel will, will make it from that much makes sense. The idea here is, well, would Intel be willing to make an ARM based processor because they have the best process technology, right? The best manufacturing technology, but it's in a direct competition with what their goals are for their Intel processor technology. So it's interesting to see how they would kind of um, have those discussions as the article kind of insinu uh, insinuates there, because on one hand, you've got one side that's like, no, we don't want to give them that advantage, right? That's our, that's our ace in the hole. That's how we plan on actually getting into this market and breaking into this market. If you give that away, we have nothing at this point. So 
I don't see them actually doing that anytime soon. And Intel is not in any kind of financial straits that they would need to split design and manufacturing off. Um, they have plenty of billions of dollars to <laughs> work on the design issue and come up with products that will compete against ARM without giving ARM the advantage of Intel's process technology. That That's kind of my theory there was wouldn't, we wouldn't necessarily, I would be very, very surprised to see Intel manufacture direct competition parts but it's 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 an interesting rumor um although you know it, i guess you got to kind of put something to it if they it would trigger an in-depth discussion hopefully they've already had the discussion many times and yeah this, this, answer, so. this so sounds like fishing <laughs> it does doesn't it <laughs> I um, thought it was interesting. Corsair is already upgrading their their water cooling uh, systems. The H80 and the H100 will be appearing around the corner fairly soon. Uh, I'm H80. guessing we'll see them at Computex uh, when I go. Out, I'm actually heading to Taiwan on Sunday. Uh, <laughs> I imagine I imagine we will see them there. So the the, the these were kind of like leaked prices and specifications on uh, mm -hmm. on a Swedish uh, reseller, and they listed the H80 and H100. And I know you are a fan uh, of these kind of, or you had become a fan or, or become aware of these kind of all-in-one water cooling units type of thing. The Corsair H100, if all this stands out to be correct, is actually pretty cool because it's a dual 120 yeah. heat sink and fan combination. Um, the specs on here listed at 22 to 39 decibels, uh, up to 92 cubic feet per minute of air movement, right? And uh, a Price of about $170, which is pretty high uh, for these kind of easy yeah. plug-and-play water coolers. But these prices might be off a little bit because of exchange rates and that kind of stuff and the fact that it actually hasn't been launched yet. But I don't yeah. know. I mean, do you have any – I mean, the H100, if it turns out to be that large, won't fit in a lot of cases. You need to have uh, the, the top of the case kind of built for a dual right. 120 radiator type of thing. Well, they, the way they've be been doing it on the H70 has 120 millimeter fans, like a pair of 120 millimeter biscuit fans. And mm -hmm. they kind of sandwiched fan, radiator, fan. And I want to say they were mounting it on the inside of the back of the case. Yep, um, they, were, they do it like kind of um, where the back kind of uh, connectivity connections are, your right. USB, your PS2, those kind of ports on the back. Most cases will have 120 port there. Right? right, and so the original uh, H50 had the radiator and a fan, right, and that's right. that's got it. And then I think it was the 70 that had like two fans on it, so it just kept getting more and more enormous inside your <laughs> chassis. This one would require wouldn't I don't think it would fit in that spot at all because the radiator itself is longer. It would have to go on the top, um, and hopefully well, more cases than just their own would fit. I don't know, it's it'll be interesting to see what the thermals look like, especially compared to the H70. You know, because yeah. I. I you know what? I, I love me some water cooling. I keep, you know, I, 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 I like water cooling. I want to see more people do easy water cooling. So right, that's I the wait. key for me. That's the key for me. Is it yeah. easy? It has to be, you know, installing an H50 or an H70 or one of the Ace Tech or one of the Antec derivatives right. is really almost as simple as installing any other heatsink, um, which which I think is key. Water cooling, great performance. You know, your standard build your own kit type of deal awesome performance better than these but way more maintenance and, and configuration and cost and setting that kind of stuff up so what's one the other story th oh sorry i was gonna say one other thing we'll probably see at computex is this uh card you're going to mention the rog matrix <laughs> gtx yeah, was, is it the neo edition i was trying to figure out why you know what i mean like what was the what was the tweak that made this difference from the uh the previous version of the GTX 580. So this one will probably, well, the, the pictures of it, the leaked photos we saw mm -hmm. have it as a three slot graphics card. Ouch. So that's a big beefy cooler and, and some beefy fans. Um, the, the leaked specs, if they turn out to be correct, aren't overclocked very dramatically over the reference specs, but that doesn't mean there isn't a ton of headroom on the GPUs themselves or on the GPU itself. Uh, because it does have, instead of a 6-pin and an 8-pin power connector, it will apparently come with two 8-pin power connectors. So it will definitely be able to pull more power. Um, my guess is what we're going to see here is a highly refined PCB, a highly refined electrical system behind the GPU, the ability to overclock it well beyond the 816 megahertz that the leaked hmm. specs 
kind of detail there because um, that's only 50, 40, you know, between 40 and 50 megahertz over the reference clock, which is nothing. You know, we've seen that on cards right. for, for a long time. And if you're going to make a three slot card and this is probably going to cost quite a bit more. <laughs> uh, yeah, it just looks like an expensive piece of hardware. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you remember the Asus Ares card, which was dual 50, 870s. It was like a $1,200 video card, um, custom design because it was two G, a dual GPU card that hadn't been built by AMD. This is not quite that complex. This is still a single GPU card. Um, looks like it's got the same amount of memory, 1.5 gigs, not even like, you know, maybe we thought they would have doubled it to three gigs or something like that. But, you know, we'll, I'm sure we'll see more details on this at Computex. There'll be looks like there's gonna be a lot of good stuff coming out next week. Where I was kind of worried that we were gonna go all the way over there and, and weren't going to see very much, uh, but especially with the 990 FX bulldozer stuff coming out and all these deals, I think I think we'll have more than our fair share to talk about next week while I'm out there as well. So excellent. Should we take a moment to thank our friends over at Netflix? We definitely should. Everybody, this episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Netflix. Netflix delivers movies directly to your home that saves you time, money, and hassle. You can instantly watch thousands of TV episodes and movies streamed directly to your PC or Mac or stream to your TV via a Netflix-ready device, including the Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, or Nintendo Wii. Plus, you can still get DVD, DVDs or Blu-rays by mail in about one business day. Watch as many movies as you want. Anytime you want, there are never any late fees or due dates. Now, they also have... Obviously, we were talking about the Netflix streaming, one of the clips or one of the movies that browsing through their collection today that uh, I thought stood out to me because one of the other guys in the office said that he had not seen this movie yet. It was Meet the Parents, which is <laughs> the first of the three movies that set up the trilogy. I guess uh, the second one would be um, Meet the Fockers and then the third one would be Little Fockers, right? Is that correct? I hope I got that right. That sounds about right. <laughs> yeah. Keep in mind, I said Fockers, F-O-C-K-E-R-S, before you go report this to anybody. <laughs> Look it up. It's on IMDb, people. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So these are these are above and beyond what I think are your classic romantic comedies. They've been stiller in them. Uh, that's always a good thing. Robert De Niro is in it, plays a uh, uh, kind of an ex-CIA father of the... Of the uh, girl right. that Ben Stiller wants to marry. It's it's a, it's a it's a really really good movie. Obviously, it's got to be a pretty good comedy if it sets up three uh a set of three two sequels to it. So, you can actually watch that instantly through Netflix today, go in there and sign up and be ready to go. Um you can instantly watch this movie or thousands of others if that is not your cup of tea, so to speak, or you've already seen it. There are thousands of TV episodes and other movies to choose from when you register for a free trial membership go to netflix.com slash twit and sign up for your free trial uh, and we thank netflix for their support of this week in computer hardware that's netflix.com slash twit i think it's time we tobias, get some emails oop. yeah man tobias actually has a pretty good question he's looking at an intel i5 2500k processor and the i7 950 uh, processor. I'm about to invest in a new gaming PC in a couple of months. I'm thinking of picking either all the parts myself or go with a package that has components picked out for me. I'm trying to choose between these two packages. Uh, both packages have Radeon HD 6950 as a dedicated graphics card and a similar setup of memory and storage. The difference is the CPUs. First has the Intel i5 2500K, the other the i7 950. The package with the i7 950 is about $100 to $150 more expensive. Do I gain anything by getting the i7 or would I see no real difference in performance going with the i5 2500K? That's the package. It's cheaper. Uh, blow are the components for the two packages. Would you say that either one is a good gaming system that will last me for a couple of years or so? Or should I perhaps pick my own components and end up with something more expensive but probably more powerful? I can't believe you didn't just go straight to the PCPro.com slash leaderboard. <laughs> <laughs> Say exactly, it. we say that to everybody. Well, how do you feel about the 6950 as a, as a gaming CPU or gaming GPU at this point? 
It's 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 great. Um, his his premise here is is this going to be something that's going to last me for a couple of years or so? And I would say yes. The sixty nine fifty is a, a powerful enough GPU. I think you'd be able to make it for a couple of years. If not, you have the capability of adding in a second one, going crossfire, and you know getting sixty to eighty plus percent more performance out of it that way. The two CPUs, so they're they're different, right? The Core i seven nine fifty is an LGA thirteen sixty six processor. The mm-hmm. Sandy Bridge. Core i5 2500K is obviously an 1155 socket processor. Um, I think both of those are going to do very well for you, again, over this two-year span. Um, $100 to $150, depending on what the total price is, might be a significant portion of it. If it's not, though, one thing to consider is that the Core i7-950 is a quad-core, hyper-threaded, triple-channel memory part. The Core i5 2500K is a quad-core non-hyper-threaded dual-channel part. So two to three-channel memory, you're not getting a whole lot of difference there uh, necessarily in terms of performance. However, you are going to see performance benefits going from four cores to four cores with hyper-threading. So if you do any video encoding, anything that maybe takes advantage of four, five, six, seven, eight threads, you will see performance gains with the Core i7-950. Whether or not that's worth 100 bucks to you, depends on exactly what you're doing. For games specifically, it's not going to make very much difference. Maybe a little bit, but not a whole lot of difference. So it depends on what the other things you're doing are. <laughs> so I gotta say I'm I I I would just go with the Core I five and and you know buy a nicer case or buy a couple of video games yeah. or buy a bunch yeah. of stuff on Steam with the extra hundred and fifty bucks. I got no problems that with just, that at all. Core i5 is a fantastic piece of silicon. Dennis wants to talk about the Revo drive. He says, hi, Ryan. Patrick found this SSD you plug directly into the PCI Express rail. Bit expensive. Can these boot the OS even if not connected to a SATA port? Is this the future? Impressive speed. What is the current market for these? Gaming? Your show is super. Thank you both for your work. Well, thank you, Dennis. Um, well, yeah, you can actually boot... Uh, Pretty much any operating system. Uh, you certainly boot Windows off of them. Um, so basically, mm-hmm. for anybody who hasn't seen these, it's essentially it's a PCI Express card with a with a giant pile of uh, memory on it that functions as a solid state drive. Uh, it, it's really back to the future for me because I remember they were using they were creating uh, solid state drives with volatile memory. Um, man, like 10, 12 years ago, uh, and you could do some amazing stuff over the PCI bus. The memory was expensive, and you had to use an external power supply for them if you didn't want to lose uh, the, what you were storing on your massive right. 2 gigabytes or 4 gigabytes of, of storage. Um, but it's a real back-to-the-future moment. A lot of the point of creating the Revo drive was to get around the limitations of uh, the 3 gigabyte cap on SATA, which is kind of over with if you're moving to a new motherboard with a six gigabyte cap. So um, the market for these is the same market for every other solid state device that's going into a desktop. Anybody who wants a fast computer, whether they're doing financial analysis or you know they want their machine to boot faster or they're a gamer or a video editor or you know pretty much anything out there where I want yep. my machine to run faster. Is it $1,500 worth of faster? I haven't seen anybody <laughs> You know what I mean? There's like this, there's, I haven't seen anybody compare the Revo drive against the latest round of um, um, six gigabit uh, SATA drives. So I would be really curious this, to see what that looks like. Mostly though, $1,500 to me is like three of my usual systems or two of my personal super high-end gaming system. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? That's just, yeah, the, the, yeah, I agree. I think you should just go with a normal SSD. Because the Revo drive where it will excel is in raw bandwidth performance. Right. Uh, you're not going to improve your latency performance. You're not going to improve, say, the the startup of applications necessarily. Um, and you can get, you know, for three hundred bucks, maybe four or five hundred bucks to get a high capacity SSD. You know, you're gonna you're gonna cut sixty six to seventy five percent off of your price there. The Revo drives are really meant for super high-end workstations that maybe have large databases, uh, server environments, those types of things. It, I, I can't recommend them to consumers unless they're uber crazy. So, you know, he's talking <laughs> about, will these boot my OS? They will. They, they 100% will. The Revo drive has the capability to do that. Uh, the Fusion IOs, which are even more expensive than this, do not have the capability still, as far as I know. But I, I guess the answer to the question is yes, they will 
if you want to spend that money. Maybe he's buying that $1,000 990X processor too, I guess. I don't know. Hmm. Uh, we have an email here from John Paul about Ifinity cables. He says, love listening to the show on my way to school each week. My question for you is this. I've recently completed my first PC build. It is a Sandy Bridge, and I've gone with the AMD 6870 graphics card. I have two monitors. Excuse me. The main is a 1080p 23-inch. The second is a 17-inch 1280 by 1024 display. I'm looking to buy a third from a New Zealand eBay equivalent called Trade Me. I'm running these screens off of the two DVI ports on my PC, and this renders the HDMI port useless, which is correct. You once you <clears throat> can't combine those three. Uh, also on the card are two mini display ports. The third screen will also be 17 inch with the same resolution as the other, but to connect it up, I think I have to use a display port, maybe for the 1080p or for the other ones. Do I have to dish out 50 bucks for one of the USB powered display port to HDMI DVI adapters, or can I use a MacBook equivalent? Uh, or am I going about this the completely wrong way? You're not going about it in the wrong way necessarily, but because you're going to, um, you're not using a dual link monitor, you're not using a 30 inch 2560 by 1600 display, you do not have to use one of the USB powered active adapters. Um, you still need an active one, but they are now much, much cheaper. If you go to Google um, Sapphire Active DisplayPort connection, you will see uh, DisplayPort mail to single link DVI cables, and they're going to run you for anywhere from twenty to thirty dollars. So, not quite the fifty to a hundred dollars that the uh, all of the adapters cost originally when we first started seeing Ifinity released. These are much more, you know, in line with prices that your average consumers are going to be willing to pay. Make sure you get one that has mini display port if you have mini display port connections as opposed to full size display port, uh, but they should all be about the same price. Uh, let's see, we've got a couple more emails here. <laughs> you Mark on the secondary here? land port actually made me laugh. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Sorry, I was trying to type something in the background and and was kind of giggling. Mark says I have a motherboard with two LAN ports, dual LAN ports. Can I use the second LAN port to provide internet access to another computer or peripheral device that does not have Wi-Fi? That is its entire purpose. <laughs> if you want to use that as machine, as far as I know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that is that is the entire. If you want to turn that machine into the world's fastest, um, I mean, I, basically the the entire purpose of that is to allow you to use it as you know a router or internet connection sharing or anything else like that. That is the only reason you have two LAN or the the primary reason you have two LAN ports on the motherboard. So go forth. Just make sure you separate them. Or if uh, I got to say, uh, dual LAN port motherboards are really cool. If you're setting up a um, uh, an IP cop, a smooth wall uh, type router, hmm. and, and it, it can actually recognize both the uh, both the Ethernet chips in the motherboard. And Gareth has a question about 4G modems. <laughs> it says, I have a follow-up question to show 119 where he discussed using 3G or 4G devices as Wi-Fi hotspots at home. Here's my question or topic for debate. Can I get a 4G modem to replace my cable modem at home and join the Sprint network so that I can kick Comcast to the curb for home internet? I heard you discuss Verizon's fast LTE network, but I've been considering Sprint for a while. Thanks. Um, if you have 3G, you are capped on Sprint. So if you're in a neighborhood where you do not have access to 4G, your 4G modem will default or your 4G router uh, will default to 3G and you will blow through the cap. Uh, it will take a long time to blow through that cap because the 3G and the 4G speeds uh, on sprints are considerably slower uh, I would hope are considerably slower than your cable modem at home. Uh, worst case scenario, I think, you know, even three, four years ago, I was seeing like eight to 16 megabits per second on my cable modem at home. And uh, although I have heard from some people who are very happy with Sprint 4G and have seen four megabits per second or better, uh, I usually struggle along uh, on a good day with one to two megabits per second. Partially it's because I'm in San Francisco where everybody and their uncle seems to have a 4G modem. Um, but uh, you know that's the, you know that's the, the downside to Verizon 4G LTE is it has a very small cap uh, unless you're willing to pay gigantic amounts of money or you don't use a lot of internet. If you download a lot of video, the caps are going to drive you insane. And if you're 
doing anything where you really need a fast internet connection or multiple fast internet connections because you and the spouse or yeah. you and the kids or the kids and the spouse are watching <laughs> multiple simultaneous Netflix uh, streams, you will go a little nuts because you will very rapidly uh, uh, saturate the 4G, uh, the Sprint 4G. But yeah, first of all, the only uh, uncapped uh, 4G that I know of is from Sprint. It is considerably slower than the Verizon uh, uh, 4G LTE. And I have heard some, from some people in, down in LA that, that the 4G LTE is starting to get a little saturated down there. So oh, no. I'm curious to hear some. Well, it, you know, I'm, I'm, one anecdote does not a fact make. That's um, true. And, and Verizon also, uh, you know, Verizon's been talking about creating family data plans, uh, and they've been talking about, you know, the idea that they're going to be relatively unlimited on bandwidth, at least for phones. So, you know, and it's, you know, I, I still don't think they've announced the follow-up plan for the, uh, the uh, amazing 4G uh, phones from Verizon. So, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, I, I have a friend of mine who's much smarter than I am and, and uh, much wiser in the ways of, of the FCC and the big telcos. And he remains convinced that the wireless providers will start lifting the caps or the, the, the wired hmm. providers will start lifting the caps to give themselves an advantage over the wireless provider. So I am hoping he is right because caps yeah, me plus me making my living distributing video over the Internet equal problematic. <laughs> Um, Agree, hundred yeah. <laughs> percent. Yeah, that was one of the interesting things we saw a couple weeks ago. Because um, Netflix, the peak, uh, we we're talking about this on Techzilla. The uh, mm -hmm. at peak, basically when the when the when the internet is floored, the peak times of consumption for the internet, fifty percent of the traffic on the internet is coming from Netflix. Like fifty percent of the uploads uh, on the internet are coming from BitTorrent clients. Uh, it's it's actually kind of amazing, but um, you know, Netflix accounts for a spectacular percent. I want to say, well, videos like fifty. I take it back. Videos like fifty percent of streaming videos, fifty percent of the traffic on the internet at peak hours. And then I want to say, of that fifty percent, you know, thirty-eight out of the fifty percent. Uh, Wow. Basically, more than a third of the traffic on the internet at peak is Netflix video viewing. It's pretty impressive. So that is that is a lot of bits they are shipping down the pipe. So they probably you know, got a I, few servers doing that, I guess, right? I'm thinking Netflix is hoping even more than I do that <laughs> that that uh, the caps get kicked in the teeth, or at least hopefully get uh, considerably higher over time. Twitch at twit.tv. That's the email address to send us questions, send Ryan questions, send me questions. What's coming up on pcper.com this week, Ryan? Wow. So this week, uh, we're basically focused on Computex, covering the largest dedicated computer show in the world over in Taipei, Taiwan. Um, <clears throat> that will all be starting on Sunday, local time over here, Monday over there. Uh, so be sure you check out pcper.com. We'll have lots of news uh, and videos and stuff like that from the show floor over there. And we are planning on doing both our podcast and This Week in Computer Hardware from uh, Taiwan as well. So you'll get to see me bright and early in the a.m. as opposed to <laughs> late in the evening. So bright and early and terribly confused. Exactly. Oh, my goodness. Um, we had some interesting stuff this week on uh, the, the text that I just posted up. We got a response from a viewer who's talking about how they used uh, Internet, basically their, their iPod Touch and an Internet calling client to allow himself and his neighbors to call loved ones when the tornadoes took out the cell phone towers. We've got uh, an HP PhotoSmart Plus E all-in-one review. We've got some options for going hands-free without a Bluetooth headset, which was A, inspired by a, an older gentleman who has hearing aids, but B, something both Veronica and I could relate to because she can't stand to put things in her ears and I can't stand Bluetooth headsets. So we had some <laughs> options there. And actually, we found out there are some modern, fast, worthy routers that still run DDWRT, some of them coming that way from the factory. So all that's coming up on TechZ. Zilla this week. Uh, that and Ashton Kutcher's uh, ADOT plus Twitter application. <laughs> awesome. The dude is an entrepreneurial genius. <laughs> oh, man, that's going to live to haunt me saying that. <laughs> that's yes. it for this yes. edition of Twitch. This week in computer hardware, I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Ryan Schrupp. See you next week on Twitch. Twitch.